since the last few episodes that we've shared have been so popular, we've decided to continue on with some of the current trends. We've got a few other things that we've been talking about lately doing uh, special episodes. We've got some, um, we've got a construction series coming up. We've got a how to buy and own a second home, very specific tight series that we'll probably be doing off the podcast and just so much more content so much good stuff is coming lately down the pipe but this is a great episode for you guys to listen to to get a little bit of a different perspective uh the episode that you're hearing today was actually recorded about a week and a half ago uh on a another podcast by uh, james garbett and danny duma where we talked a lot about the current state of the market but things from a different perspective you know these guys ask me questions more from the eyes of a real estate and a client perspective some good questions about the real impact of the stress test, what buyers need to look out for, or not look out for. We definitely went in depth. It's a bit of a longer episode, but a really, really strong listen. And I would implore you guys to check out their podcast afterwards if you like the content so we can make sure to support them back. Hey guys, I'm Alex McFadden here with Thrive Mortgage Co. Typically my partner is Dean Lawton and Derek Williamson are beside me today. They are offline for this episode, but we'll be back next week with some excellent planned content. I think you're going to really enjoy this this show again we go into some pretty deep topics and a lot of good conversations now just a quick reminder before you get to the episode we do the five star review giveaways we've been giving away mugs and coffee every single week all you got to do is go to the podcast page on itunes leave a five star review and send us a screenshot so we know and as simple as that we're going to send you some delicious coffee and incredible mug no matter where you are in the country so get on that guys get on that hey listen if you guys are interested in exploring your current mortgage situation this is the best time to look at doing in history rates have risen in the last little while they have not fully come back up and we're actually seeing uh, some promotional offers that uh, have never been offered before on the market so whether it's buying a new home uh, reinvesting in yourself uh, or looking at your existing mortgage situation make sure to reach out to the boys here at thrive mortgage co and the whole team so we can take very good care of you anyhow enough about that enjoy the episode i hope you really like it it was a lot of fun to record and i hope it comes off on the show listen in enjoy the episode We'll talk to you soon. What's up, guys? You are listening to the YBR Remo Show, where we talk all things Vancouver real estate and mortgages, take boring topics, and make them interesting. Make sure to stay tuned to listen to everything you need to know how to put cash back in your pocket, create wealth in real estate, and simplify the complicated. I'm excited for uh, today's episode and we've got a lot to talk about. So much has changed. And I mean, we were sitting here before this podcast episode here trying to figure out what do we talk about? There's so much right now. So there's yeah. definitely not a lack of information that we can kind of run through here. Love it. There's been some changes in interest rates. The stress test is potentially going to be adjusted in a month from now. So there's lots to talk about in terms of current updates in uh, Greater Vancouver Real Estate and the lending world. I want to start with a big compliment for Alex, though. I think uh, what he's doing with video, educating consumers, other brokers in his his world, I think is um, really exciting and has definitely pushed James and I and our team to kind of do the same in the real estate world. So big uh, props to Alex. And if you're not following Alex on social media and you're thinking about buying and selling real estate, check out his, um, his video. He is adding a ton of value to consumers. And I think... Um, Man, I don't know anyone else in your world that is doing as much as good as what you're doing. And it is, uh, it's motivating for, for teams like us as well, which is awesome. You've kind of groomed our behavior in a way, because when there's a change, we just, we, we feel that we don't have to research it. We just wait for your post and <laughs> learn about what the change is in lending. You know, the, one of the things about uh, this, this social media world, and in particular, the mortgage space is, you're right. I don't really have a lot of people in the mortgage world that I look at as people that I'm trying to follow or be like. But just like anything in life, we try and um, position ourselves to a degree of someone who's idealistic of what our goals are. And so from the inside looking out, I'm constantly feeling like we're not doing enough or we could do better or we could do more. So seeing you guys come up so quickly and do such a fantastic job and really take hold, hire on a full-time videographer, do the podcast and, and focus just purely not on the sales element, but more on an educational element it's just been incredible to see. And uh, it's just so cool. Just so cool to, to see that. Um, and it doesn't, it's not, um, and I don't think any real estate agent or mortgage professional or anything of that, that nature should be 
uh, threatened by it, but they should have their eyes open by how cool this opportunity is for us now, even with social media continuously changing, you know, we've got Clubhouse and TikTok and Reels and all these different things constantly evolving. My mind is always being blown just sitting back trying to do <laughs> financing and then figure out that stuff. But um, really cool to see you guys take a hold of that and really do a good job. So uh, kudos to you guys for Thank jumping you. all yeah. in. I, I, I know that, uh, and this is the last point on that is Jamie and I, you, you know, we, we uh, had a beer at uh, Trading Post for the Monopoly, Realtor Monopoly, about a year and a half, two years ago or something like that now. I uh, had a great station and a coffee after that. And then after meeting Denny at, at the office, you guys were just full on into like, how do I take, you know, this educational component and bring it into my business and then executing. So kudos to you guys. Awesome. Well, let's just like compliment it. each other for the next 30 minutes. Let's just like keep going. <laughs> no <laughs> listeners, but we will feel really good after this. So. <laughs> Let's get into what's going on and yeah. let's start with um, stress tests. So maybe just give us a quick summary of what is potentially changing, how that's going to affect consumers. Yeah, so the interesting thing, first and foremost, about this stress test is this is kind of the second time around of trying to do something similar to this. Um, right pre-COVID, uh, OSFI, which is the governing, uh, well, I don't want to get too far deep into it, but essentially, more or less, the, the uh, governing body of the banks in Canada who sets up and... Um, uh, uh, monitors, things like the stress test and lending and so forth, uh, they actually implemented or started to implement a stress test back in 2019 in the beginning, right before COVID occurred. And then obviously with COVID occurring, they just put a halt on any changes or updates. And so what was supposed to happen at that time was actually, believe it or not, a relaxing of the stress test for uninsured mortgages. Mm -hmm. Now I'll explain what uninsured mortgages more in just a quick second, but they were actually gonna alter it and reduce it back then, believe it or not, well, hypothetically, the way they had set it up. But it was so confusing that it took a long time to get passed and then it didn't get passed and then COVID happened. So right now is, I guess, I think... Um, and, and not just myself, but any if you read any of the expert opinions from people that matter and understand this space, I think this is just their way to potentially get votes while making it look like they're making a change to the market. This actually does not... Um, impact that many people. I mean, it's for uninsured mortgages. That means that someone who is buying a home over a million dollars is slightly impacted. That means someone who's refinancing their property, someone who's buying a rental home. These are the people that are mostly impacted. And again, it's for 30 year amortizations. So if you're buying a home with less than 20% down, first time buyers, you already have a stress test which is currently 4.79 today, but it could change. And so what's happened here effectively, just to explain the rules more uh, clearly, is they've just slightly increased that benchmark rate for those people I mentioned before to 5.25 today, or the greater of what they're calling the contract rate plus 2%. Now that makes no sense to anybody. It doesn't even make sense to me. What is the contract rate? I don't know. They haven't <laughs> defined it. They have literally not defined what the contract rate is. So we're here trying to figure out what the stress test is and everybody's losing their minds thinking they're not gonna be able to qualify and nobody knows who it affects. So let's talk about things that we do know. First and foremost, those people I mentioned before, 30 year mortgages, over a million bucks, refinances, rental properties, those guys are gonna lose 5% borrowing power today. We know that for sure if this takes effect on June 1st, okay? But the long-term ramifications, what is the contract rate? theoretically, what they're looking at is the big banks are going to dictate this, which is a, a problem in its own. But the big banks will essentially dictate what is the contract rate. And I assume it'll be some form of an average, which will be probably adjusted on a quarterly basis, plus 2%. Now, if you're still listening after all that, and you're not completely <laughs> lost. Because <laughs> it is like to, to explain it on its own is challenging. I think the short version is you got a bunch of people out there who don't really understand lending. The banks are dictating this, which is a, just a massive issue um, and saying, basically, we control what consumers can buy or not buy. The good news is a lot of people have to keep in mind those people who are buying with less than 20 down, those people who are not going to their maximums are not impacted. You're not impacted. The downside is there are a lot of people right now who are trying to qualify for their maximum. The stress test is already two to three points above the market right now. There are some families that will lose the 5% borrowing power. And the highest and the biggest impact, before I stop my rant here, that I've seen actually is consumers who are looking to take advantage of the market to restructure their existing debt portfolios, which means basically pay off debt and reduce their overall cost. The families that it, that it hurts the most are the ones that it should be helping the most. That's what I've seen so far. You mentioned the million dollar 
threshold there. Uh, you know, we run into a lot of like, I, I guess the most, a very common mortgage range for us is say 500 to 800,000 uh, dollars and, and 20% down in that range. How does that, how does that look right now? Is it affected at all? Well, when you say 20% down, I assume you're asking, can someone still buy a property at less than a million dollars with Sorry, if someone's buying a nine hundred thousand dollar townhouse and they're putting twenty percent down, uh, I just wanted to be clear on that that million over million dollar mark. Is that for purchase prices over a million or mortgage value over a million? It's always purchase price. Purchase always price. Purchase okay. price. Gotcha. That's what they're they're considering. And so okay. this goes back to twenty sixteen, where uh, where the uh, first round of stress tests came in, and uh, there were a variety of insurance based rules that basically said that if your home was over a million bucks, you had that twenty percent down. So it's always based on the purchase price. Now, when when we're looking at this stress test increase, I I feel like it's probably really in, affecting that when it went from what Denny and I see the, the buyers that are buying say under one five usually are stretching themselves to get that house. So that one million to one five, that to me seems like this may have impact those buyers the most, and arguably that's the strongest segment of the market. So maybe they can handle it the most. Um, what are your thoughts on how it impacts that one to one five, and and just from what you see? Over two million, we don't see too many people maxing themselves out. So my assumption is that over two million, it's not as impactful, and in that one to one five, it's it's more impactful. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, no question. That's exactly what you meant. Uh, we were talking about before, which is that it's the families that needed the most that are impacted the most. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, the it, to speak about that one one five. I mean, we have to talk about different market segments. You guys are in New Westminster uh, and and throughout variety of areas in the Tri Cities, and actually, you guys are everywhere. But you know, a lot of your business <laughs> is based in the New Westminster area, right? So we're seeing a lot of families uh, purchase detached homes in that one to one five market. I imagine. Um, and the same thing with other areas of the valley. Like realistically, that is a detached home. It's over a million bucks now. And so what I've noticed, and this isn't something new, but specifically since COVID's occurred, uh, everybody wants to get out of strata and get into a detached home. And majority of people that to get into that type of property need to have a basement suite in place. And that basement suite helps them to qualify. So anytime you're taking away someone's qualification based on this uh, stress test, even though we can financially prove that they should be able to handle it, there is a, an impact. And, and you know, we've already seen... Um, nervousness in the marketplace in such a short amount of time since this was announced. This was announced in you know the beginning of April. And we've already kind of started to see people peel back and have some uncertainty in, in regards to moving forward. What does this look like? Now, I think in the end, guys, you know, this is just going to create more pent up demand. Like they're going to sit back, wait, 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 and then and then it'll just be another bang of people trying to get into the market when they realize that it's only you know a five percent reduction in their purchase price. But the people I'm most worried about, and and worry is probably not the right word. The people that again, I, I mentioned that I've got a few families that I just helped uh, refinance their their mortgages, reduce their interest rates, get rid of like high interest debt that they accumulated through COVID. And believe it or not, there's a lot of people out there who took on a fair amount of debt, or or they're just trying to clear themselves up right now because they're thinking it's a great time to get out of this ugly situation and get their finances back in order. Those are the ones where we're qualifying them to the maximum to pay out those credit cards, which you have no issue with getting a credit card, no issue getting an unsecured line of credit, no issue getting a car loan. Um, but to reduce the cost of that, there's a, there's, it is challenging, right? I, I just got a client, um, you know, barely approved with an exception and the, the banks are starting to look at these types of things um, at the current stress test rates. Whereas if the new stress test was in, in you know, in place, they would still have this $30,000 credit card, you know, hovering over their head. So it was life-changing for them. And those are the people that we're seeing that could be really impacted, uh, not not the ones that are nervous about it. A lot of those people just don't fully comprehend the difference in the rules. It's funny that often when there's changes like this, they impact the people who need the help the most, right? It, uh, it seems like looking back the last five years, whenever there's been some sort of government intervention in real estate, that it's hurting the people that they're, uh, you know, they're proposing that it's helping. You mentioned basement suites, and I want if you can just explain a little bit, because looking at resale right now in the last six months, I've never seen the gap of a house, a very comparable house next door or in that neighborhood sell at such a big number comparatively to a home without a basement suite. So obviously that's what, it's, what that's telling us is a lot of young families are upsizing and to qualify for those mortgages, they need the mortgage help. But can you just maybe touch on explaining what what help that is? Let's say a two-bedroom basement suite in the Tri Cities that rents for sixteen to eighteen hundred dollars. How is that helping the buyer's lending? 
Yeah. Let, let, so let's go back on this. This is really interesting because uh, I'd say about two years ago, I remember this conversation so clearly. I talked to one of my appraisal uh, friends who owns a, an appraisal firm in, in the Vancouver area. And I said to him like, man, hey, I, like I, I think a, a basis, we, I, I thought like theoretically to me, the value of that is at least $75,000 or $100,000 to a, to a client. And he's like, no, man, not even close. Like when we're appraising a property with a suite, like just from appraisal perspective, right? Because we're looking at it from different ways. Mm-hmm. So from appraisal perspective, you know, that's like 25, 35, maybe 50,000 with a high end home that's earning, you know, $1,800 of rental income or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I, I respect his, his approach. Like I respect it. It's like, yeah, that's what we're seeing. Fast forward now to uh, 2020, last year, 2021 now. And like what you just said, the gap, like that's goldmine for people. And there's a few reasons for that. Like, let's look in the Fraser Valley, the average one bedroom uh, a condo or not condo, um, basement suite in, in most properties is renting for more than $1,100, right? You're looking at 1100 1200 and more. And the Tri-City is, you know, you know, I would suggest probably eleven to 1300 for a one bedroom as well. You know, from a mortgage perspective with rates being as low as they are, and even if they're in the mid to high twos, that's like $1,600, like you just said there, like $1,600, that's a lot. That's like four. Hundred thousand dollars of mortgage money there, so if you're telling someone that they could go in and buy a rental suite, a rental property, the rental suite for a hundred thousand dollars more or one hundred fifty thousand dollars more, but that covers four hundred thousand dollars of their debt, maybe mm-hmm. less some taxes and expenses, but realistically, four hundred thousand dollars of their debt, that is a huge impact from a budgetary standpoint, right? That is massive. So mm-hmm. is it is it worth four hundred thousand dollars more? Is it worth one hundred fifty thousand dollars more? It becomes harder and harder to judge. But here's the kicker. <laughs> Now, this is where things get interesting. And I'll, I, I don't know how many times I've explained this to, to real estate uh, partners, to clients. I, we continuously explain this is that every lender has their own policy on this. And the policies change quite frequently in terms of how much rental income you can use to qualify for someone. Mm-hmm. Case in point, one of the big banks would typically see, again, we'll use that $1,100 number. You would see about a $35,000 lift in their purchase price, maybe 40, okay, mm-hmm. if the conditions are right. Another big bank, with an exception, again, don't get me into exceptions, basically it's not a guarantee, likely they'll allow it, that same scenario would be $140,000 of qualification. So I'm going to go out and guess that a whole bunch of people are smart and they're working with a really good mortgage broker and they understand that they can get $140,000 more and that's forcing those price points up and they realize that the impact on their end budget is it reduces their total cost by about $300,000. Huge, massive. Totally. I think we should acknowledge to buyers out there that just because you can qualify for more doesn't mean that that suite truly adds that much value to a house. I mean, there are cases where it does. And I think a really good example here, Alex, is do lenders value legal suites versus unauthorized suites? Or do they even take that into consideration at all? Oh, that's a fun one. So so um, one of our, uh, again, let's go back. I'm, I like to, to talk to people in the industry. Appraisal uh, partners came out and released some information two weeks ago and said that uh, and now what's happening is, is the banks are actually asking more frequently than they have in the past to make sure that this is a legal basement suite to use the rental income. Now, there are some workarounds because, of course, we got to find the workarounds. But as of today, not a big difference Yet, other than a few of the big banks, Big Big Blue, Big Blue requires typically a legal suite and a couple of the others, and I'm referring to the uh, RBC at that point, if you guys were wondering. Um, it, it, there are a couple that do, so definitely there is a higher value for a legal suite. Additionally speaking, I imagine just from generally, the, the consumer feels more comfortable, more confident, and they're not going to get you know their neighbor calling and complaining or anything of that nature. So there's no doubt there's a higher value. From a lending perspective, I would say there's no difference in terms of what the dollar amount is going to return. Like it's, it's not a difference, but there is a difference if, you know, two years from now they stop accepting the income from these properties, which I don't anticipate is going to happen, but could happen. I hope I answered your question there. Yeah, I, it's a complicated question because it, it's city by city in terms of suite, you know, what, <laughs> every city is different in terms of how they evaluate those unauthorized suites. And, and I imagine every bank looks at them differently. And yeah, and then there's also unauthorized suites that are approved by the city too, you know, that the city's aware of and they allow, um, yeah, it's very unlikely that cities throughout Lower Mainland are going to crack down on author- unauthorized suites and put a bu- bunch of people out of home. Um, so maybe banks recognize that. Yeah, that, 
it's a complicated thing. But I, I think they, they to, saw that. Oh, in, just a side note in, in Surrey and Clayton Clayton Heights in particular, we we had a whole you know series of issues occur a few years ago, and I don't remember the specifics surrounding it. But there was a massive crackdown on these unauthorized suites back in I think 2017 or 2018, and it kicked a whole bunch of people out of homes. But um, that's where the, the tenancy board uh, you know obviously mm. started to stand up and saying like you're kicking people out of homes that need a place to live. There's not enough homes for these people. What on earth are you trying to do here? So the city wanted to obviously get tax, right? The, sorry, claim um, and, and get paid more taxes, which is fair, I suppose. Uh, but they were, took the, a very, very incorrect approach in doing so. From a lending perspective, I think that most lenders try to remain pretty vanilla about it. It's all about risk, right? And risk and reward. And I think that's where maybe we'll go later in the conversation about why these the lenders are starting to put people into continuously different segments now of lending. And I think we'll continue to see that going forward. So who knows, maybe one day there's a different type of premium for an unauthorized suite versus an authorized suite. But how will they dictate that and how will they you know, govern that approach? Who knows? Yeah. I, I'm curious to know over the, like we, we're talking about stress test changes and there's been lots of changes over the, over the years. I'm, I'm curious to know, like just like on a high level, say, Whatever example comes to mind, whatever time range comes to mind, but you know, a thought would be like a, a thousand, hundred thousand dollar family household income over the last five years. How has that stretched in terms of how much mortgage you can get with that? Like where we're at today, like are, are people at that household income able to qualify for more than they were three, four, five years ago? Less? Um, like how is the how is the amount of money? available to people changed over the recent history. And five years is just an example, whatever horizon makes sense to you. Well, let's let's definitely use just 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 five years as an example, because 2016 is when the biggest round of changes occurred in in the stress test. So before 2016, if you took a like, and, and this is going back on this whole five year fixed rate situation. In case anybody's listening, the five year fixed rates only became very popular kind of towards uh, uh, I guess 2010 to 2012 when the first quote unquote stress test for variable rate mortgages came in. Otherwise, it used to be short term fixed or variable. That was very common before that. Um, why people started taking fixed rates were obviously a few reasons. The short version is that it could qualify for more. You could qualify for more on a five-year fixed term than you could on a variable rate because that was one of the, the uh, rules that they put in place. I can't remember the year here, so I'm going to go early 2000s. Um, so fast forward here into 2016 uh, when they instituted the, uh, I guess, the stress test on the uh, insured mortgage, which is when you're putting less than 20% down. Now you had to qualify, even if you took a fixed rate, you had to qualify at this, this what they call a benchmark rate, which was set by the government, it's typically 2% above whatever you're, you're paying, basically, right? And so that reduced qualification pretty dramatically, 15 to 20% right off the bat. So that was the first round of changes that you would have noticed. And what is there actually was that people just started finding money to put 20% down, right? Now, not everybody could do that. So there were a lot of first-time buyers that were squeezed, which we still hear about today. Um, but, you know, then what happened is people started, that's where people started looking into getting family money, gifts, uh, you know, parents' line of credits and so forth. Because when they put 20% down, they can still qualify for more on the quote unquote five-year fixed rate and then, you know, get more money, obviously. There were 30-year amortizations, there were 35. Fast forward again, end of 2018, they're like, holy crap, things are way too, you know, crazy again. Let's put another stress test in place. And so they, they put in that same kind of stress test in place or similar uh, for all mortgages. Uh, and I know there's credit unions that don't do it, but we're just going to say for the sake of conversation for all mortgages, everybody had to have a stress test. B lenders, A lenders, every lender, every product in every situation with the exception of those credit unions, which we'll talk about later. So to answer your question, Jamie, uh, that's a, it was a big impact on their overall qualification as a family. You're reducing your overall qualification by 20% or more in many circumstances. So for that $100,000 uh, a situation, you know, we saw a reduction uh, where someone could qualify for, let's, again, let's just use general terms here, where someone could qualify for, you know, $450,000 possibly. Now we're looking at them qualifying for, say, three hundred and sixty or three seventy five. dollars And again, this is a blanket statement here. So I'm just trying to suggest that essentially it was a big impact. And we saw that impact. And you guys can remember that 2019, we saw a flattening of the real estate market, especially in the detached space. Would you, would you agree? Do you recall that? Oh, yeah. Massive. Yeah, it felt we like a bottom. A you know, I, I think we even commented that a few times that 2019 was, uh, well, I, I don't know, it, it, early 2020 was showing recovery and 2019 felt like the bottom. The biggest market that I noticed it was in the condo market, especially in the Fraser Valley, where we saw, mm -hmm. let's say, two bedroom condos selling for four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars. Boom! All of a sudden, they were worth three hundred and seventy-five to three eighty. But that was one hundred percent in this case due to that 
stress test because it, again, it was a 15 to 20% drop, huge for a lot of families. And so like realistically now, fast forward to today, people have adapted to the market. They're, they're, they've gained equity, right, in their homes. Now they can take that equity if they have say 20% and uh, purchase those you know larger properties and so forth. So there's a lot of different ways to get in and, and, and qualify. And I think just at the end of the day, like I said, adaptation has occurred so people can qualify. Banks have somewhat adapted to these markets as well. Um, and people are earning a little bit more money, which is nice. But the reality, man, at the end of the day is um, like the, I, I don't know, I guess the government's rule is essentially instead of creating more supply, let's just restrict what people could buy. And the biggest impact, guess, guess who it is? Always people getting into the market. The first time buyer, these are the ones that are always hurt the most. Unless your family has a big house that they can borrow money against or a line of credit or something of that, and that, that nature. Um, I've never seen so many families moving together, co-applying together or trying to. Uh, and or just gifts exchanging hands. I would guess that on every second first time buyer file we do, there is a gift from family. That common, hey? Wow. 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 I guess, you know, some of the concerns I've heard over, you know, you get these cheap mortgage rates. Uh, maybe people, some people think, okay, everyone's going to be stretching themselves. What's going to happen three to five years when those mortgages come due? How are you finding the, um, any concerns over, what would that just be like the, at the end of your term of the mortgage, just automatically rolling over or any concerns of a bank not financing at the end of that term? Or how do you have those conversations? So I've had the first experience uh, recently where a bank deso- decided not to auto renew a mortgage um, and they basically blamed it on COVID. This was not a you know traditional, it was a, it w- I would consider it to be an alternate bank, but uh, uh, they blamed it on COVID. They pulled the client's credit report. They asked for income documents. The client wasn't able to show, uh, she had inconsistent work. She was in the film industry and they, they said, we're not satisfied with this and we're not, we're not moving forward with your agreement. So we were able to find, and they didn't give her much notice, to be honest with you, they gave her 30 days notice. We we're able to obtain and find all, you know another lender for her in that time frame. But I, I think Jamie, it doesn't make a lot of sense for a bank if you've been making your payments, it, it, you know, and, and you, they've had no issues with there. It wouldn't make a lot of sense for a bank not to renew, right? Mm-hmm. Unless there was a substantial drop in the market conditions. It's the second term when banks make the most money, right? If you renew at the bank, they're starting to really make some cash. That first five year term, you know, the first you know, say two years is really realistically a loss leader. They're not making any money in the first couple of years because of all the in- administrative and the setup costs. So it's not until you hit like say year three, they're starting to earn some money and then year four or five, they're starting to earn a profit. So they're banking on you staying there. They don't want you to go anywhere. So I would anticipate that would not be an issue. Where I have a higher uh, concern between you and I is consumer spending will obviously ramp up as we get out of this COVID situation. There is literally zero um, restrictions on credit cards. I'm way more concerned about credit cards and car loans than I am about mortgages, man. Like your mortgage payment, your, your interest rate goes up by 1%, you know, so it's a few hundred bucks. Like people people use the term, this, this term gets me. I, I struggle with this one, skyrocketing rates. I'm like, what does that mean to you? You pay a credit card with 20% interest and you let that sit there every single month. That's skyrocketing yeah. interest rates. Your mortgage rate goes up 1%. That's not skyrocketing. That's, that's fair. Like that's not a substantial cost. Let's put this in context, guys. Let's use some numbers. For every quarter percent, your mortgage rate goes up. That's $12 for every hundred grand. So let's do the math on that. For a $500,000 mortgage a quarter, 12 times five, 12 times five, that's 60. Okay. Six times four, that's 240. So if you're borrowing $500,000 and your rate goes up 1% in, in five years, and if you can't afford that $240, I have to be very honest with you, you should not probably own that home or we need to have a quick look. And, and that's not a personal situation on people because there are things that happen in people's lives that they cannot control. I've seen it, but I'm just trying to suggest they should do some budgeting and look at the other factors if there isn't that $240 to be, to be found there. Mm-hmm. That in its own is a big reason they have this stress test so that people can qualify for less than they could actually afford based on those numbers. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's a great way to explain it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I get that, like, let's just talk about for a second. W- one of the hottest questions that I get every day is like, again, should I go fixed or variable? I mean, that's been the endless discussion since I started in this industry. And, um, you know, what, what people say all the time right now, especially first time buyers or they listen to their parents, oh, rates were 18% in 1982. I'm like, yes, they were. <laughs> when was the last time that happened? <laughs> you know, and not to be rude, but um, I think we just have to put things in context, and we have to look but, at history, and we have to look at statistics. And, and the reality is, as long as you know the numbers, you can feel more comfortable. You can feel a lot more comfortable budgeting. So, if someone was listening to this today and they were buying, borrowing four five hundred, you know, thousand dollars, and they were concerned about that, make sure you've got a two hundred fifty dollar lift in your budget. 
Great. And and, and I, I love those old rate examples. We get them too still. But like, even if rates went to five or six percent, I think there'd be chaos on the streets. You know, it'd be a madhouse. Um, like just so many people. And the reason why our real estate is at the price levels they are is because of lending and afford what people can afford. And that's due to lending and rates. And that's all a part of it. There um, would be a lot of angry people on Reddit and Twitter. <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah. You know, I, a good question on that fixed versus variable. I, I think a more specific, tempting question that uh, I run into is those those uh, appealing two to four year fixed rates, particularly the two and three year. They always seem to be a very low rate, or they have been lately. And I mean, how do you weigh that versus <sighs> versus variable? Um, yeah, it really, it's kind of. I find that whoever is considering those two, three year fixed are often trying to focus on the rate and they're probably comparing it against a closed variable. Any thoughts on those types of mortgages? Honestly, like I think there's a lot of value to be found in the short term closed on occasion. Like I think it can make sense depending on the circumstance. The reason I'm I'm more comfortable looking at okay, so let's just compare fixed to fixed, right? As a quick example, typically the first thing someone says is what's your what's a five year fixed rate? And obviously it's a very difficult question to answer without a lot of information. But um, looking at like a two or a three or a four year term, what the reason that can make sense for a lot of families is because I, I don't know if you guys know this, but statistics year over year over year over year over year continuously show that people make a change to their mortgage on average every three years. Like that's when they make mm-hmm. a change on average. So if that's the case why would it make any sense to put yourself in a situation where you're going to be destined to pay a penalty of 25 or 35 or 45 or $50,000, like I see all the time on your mortgage? So a two, three, four year term can make sense because it's easier to project your life. Like look at, look back at your guys' lives two years ago. Did we experience, did we expect a pandemic and then interest rates to drop by, you know, 2% and all these different things to happen in our lives? No, right. We had no idea. Um, so two, three, four year, there's a lot of value to be had there. If you are someone that likes to know exactly what your interest payment's going to be, and you're doing a little bit of a comparison now to kind of answer your question a little bit deeper, Jamie, I think it's subjective to the personal, the person's uh, profile, what they're looking to do, what they, they want. I mean, as we all know, the Bank of Canada right now is had historical lows, which means that your variable rate is historically low. One of the key advantages of taking a variable rate is, well, there's two things. One, if you ever need to get out of it or restructure it, you're, you're paying very minimal costs. And that in itself is enough reason to go variable. Three months of interest, that's equal to maybe half percent of your loan balance, right? As a, as a multiple property mortgage holder myself, I'm always variable because I look at history and I look at total cost. Total cost accumulated is the interest plus the extra costs and penalties. And so if I look at that and say, well, you know, in the next one, two, three, four, five years, if I need to get out of this, I know exactly what my expenses are going to be. I feel a heck of a lot more comfortable. Plus, I know if the Bank of Canada decide to raise interest rates by three quarters of a percent, I'm basically paying what I would have paid on the fix. So I might as well start from the bottom and work my way up and, and start from ahead. Now, going back to your question about the short term fixed. I'll be blunt with you. It can make sense for a lot of people. It can make sense. And there's a ton of value to be found in a two-year or a three-year term right now. I would much more highly, if someone really wanted to take a fixed rate term, I would much more highly recommend that two or three-year term versus that five-year term today. But if you're comfortable with it, typically the variable provides more flexibility. And that's why we would look at that. And you could also lock in the discount. So a lot of people don't realize you're not locking in the rate at 1.2% or 1.3 or 1.4% on the variable today. You're locking in that discount, which is the nice thing about it, right? And, you know, I think just for listeners, just, you know, today's rates are low. Do you, could you share ballparks of the difference between a five-year variable versus a three-year fix versus a five-year fix? Just Okay, so let's, there's multiple yeah. segments, right? So someone buying with less than 20% down right now on a variable, could you, I'd say your rates are probably a discount of prime minus one to prime minus 120, somewhere in that ballpark, depending on your circumstance and what you're willing to put up with. And so that puts you prime is 2.45 with most banks. So we're at like 1.3 to 1.4 on average, I would suggest maybe mm-hmm. 1.45 for most conventional you know, solid, you know, no, no restrictions on your mortgage or anything like that for a variable. Whereas uh, a short term fixed rate right now, we're seeing rates between 1.59 to 1.99, depending on the term of two years to, to four years. So very close. Five year fixed rates are above 2% for most lenders right now, unless you're willing to eat some restrictions, which honestly, here's the thing. Guys, like we talk about things like uh, um, you know, coffee and beer and, and and vacations and stuff. People are no no problem spending an extra thousand bucks on you know upgrading their vacation or five thousand bucks on their vacation or twenty thousand dollars on their car, but they're worried about a tenth of a point on their mortgage, which could be the equivalent of five hundred dollars over the term. And that tenth of a point, going back to restricted versus a non restricted mortgage, could mean that they're locked in, they finance, and they can't do anything without selling their property. Like that's insane to me. 
I went on a rant there, but no. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no. I, I... <laughs> Shop smart, you, you, right? You know, you... Basically, r- sorry to to get back to that. The the reality is, you need to start looking at mortgage financing not by the tenths of a point on the interest rate. You need to look at it based on what am I going to be gaining over the long term, and what is my total cost over the term or the life. I I think you've made a really good point there on the that total cost alone. I I mean, I know over the years through mortgages I've had, I've uh, and Denny as well. Like we've paid plenty of penalties over the years. And, um, you know, yeah, it, it feels good when you get to the end of the term and you get out without a penalty. Uh, but yeah, it's it's very common to break a mortgage and taking into account that penalty versus a variable. Uh, I mean, that's, that's a great comment there. I think a lot in the past, and I won't say today because I think it's more common, that variable has been more accepted over the last few years. But I definitely know in the past there, you know, there's been those tactic, the, the fear tactic. You know, you you know what you're paying for the next five years, and and that was uh, off. You know, from a mortgage specialist, I just heard so many mortgage specialists say that um, back in the day. Not as much today, but that just that fear of the unknown just led more people to choose a fixed uh, historically. Uh, let, 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 just let's talk, talk on that. What is the biggest fear most people have? Is they're actually the payments changing? There are mortgage mm-hmm. products that you could take with a variable rate where the payment doesn't change. So just as a little hot tip for anybody listening, um, that is the number one fear most people have. When they talk about rates rising, they're not talking about rates rising, they're talking about their payment changing. And so there Mm -hmm. is a way out of that. So there is a happy medium where you can get a a variable rate mortgage with a low cost. Guys, I've refinanced um, uh, two of my properties twice in the last year. Right. So um, I'm also with you guys in terms of paying the prepayment penalty. I just got an email to me this morning before our podcast here today from a client who's uh, upsizing and their families are moving together, which is super common right now. Um, and each of them has a $26,000 and $28,000 penalty to get out of their big bank mortgage right now on a fixed rate that they locked into uh, two and a half years ago. That's $50,000 of equity. They wanted me to calculate to them because we had this conversation that was like, hey guys, did you did you get offered this option? Did anybody explain this to you up front? Like, no, no, no. We walked into our branch. They said, here's an awesome rate. We talked to a broker, but but you know, he wasn't able to offer as good of a rate. We went over here and I'm like, this cost you $50,000. That's someone's salary for a year. Mm-hmm. That's right? big. So yeah. yeah. Anyways. Yeah. The, or, sorry, Denny, I've been taking all the questions. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead if you got something. You know, I got a I got a few here on my uh, on my notes. I, I think uh, I mean I think you answered that fixed versus variable. Great, I, and it's always a situational case by case sort of scenario. Um, one thing that we haven't got into this whole segments thing, and I and I I can't help but think, you know, when you know I, I'm I'm a realtor. My wife's an accountant. I've noticed that banks like accountants. They like school teachers. They like doctors. They like stability. And like if you're self employed, that's always been deemed a little higher risk. Nowadays, I'm kind of seeing this whole, if you're a, a restaurant manager in the event space, if you're working for Hilton, you know, if you, I, I, I guess I'm curious about how banks are going to evaluate hospitality, um, uh, hotels, uh, events, these, these industries that are clear, or, or airline pilots, uh, these industries that are clearly hit. What do you, what's going on there? Man, like this is a good, good uh, conversational thing to, to think about here. So they have been, first of all, the, the banks have been very slow to respond. I'll, I'll let you know that right now. Like most of the banks have been very slow to respond. Like we're just starting to see different types of policies come down the pipe in the last month or two. Uh, one of the big banks just uh, sent a notice last week. And hey, we're, now we're starting to look at a three-year average from people who are self-employed instead of a two-year average, uh, Jamie. So they'll look at their, say, 2018, 2019, and 2020. Um, taxes. Wow. And they'll start to average those things out, which which can slightly bring someone up. But if we think about it theoretically, if you were in the event space industry, I, I had a client who who typically earned um, about $100,000 gross every year in her event business. She's a contractor. And you know, last year, obviously, knocked her off the wagon, right? <clears throat> she's doing really well. She adapted her business. She's now online. And she's done a phenomenal job of bringing back kind of like an alteration of her business and, and on track to earn a similar wage as she was before. But the banks won't recognize that. They will not recognize that. I'm talking about the typical banks. They won't recognize that she's doing really well in the last six months here. I mean, they'll look at it and say, great that she is, but they're not using that for the sake of her application. And I'm just talking about your typical, you know, big five banks, if you will, right? We're also um, uh, have options outside of that, just in case anybody's listening, there are options outside of that, but your conventional institutions with your low rates that you want, 
they're not going to start adapting quickly. So let's just talk about segments first and foremost. You know what the crazy thing about what I do every day is, is like, especially like talking to my counterparts, I do a lot of uh, networking with guys in the States, is there's always talk about um, technology taking over the mortgage space and even the real estate space, but specifically the mortgages, because you can search online, Google interest rates, and there's your options there. And that's great if you're um, a lawyer making you know, $400,000 a year with no debt with, you know, 30% down and you don't want any advice or direction or anything, boom, you can click, 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 there you go, right? Funny enough, those guys are actually great clients and they, they do want the advice typically, which is awesome. Um, with that being said, almost, I'd say 80% of, of people are something else. Like they're not, that 20% of people that have that steady job, there's 80% of the economy that is not in a steady job. People are becoming a contractor. They now have side hustles. They're running restaurants. They're, you know, like there's so many different opportunities that are out there right now. And so what we are seeing is from a lending perspective, uh, more now than ever, people are being put into all these different little mini buckets and mini programs. And that applies to the rates, to the qualification, to the lenders. You're starting to see different banks start to niche in on certain types of people and certain types of products, not like they used to in the past. So I guess what I'm trying to get to, Jamie, is that um, now more than ever, understanding your financial situation and having those conversations in advance, I tell people like, think of us almost like a financial planner to a degree for your mortgage versus just a place to go get go, go get to that mortgage qualification. Like you need to be starting to look at these things more in the future than you have in the past. Just a quick end to that rant, and this is a little bit of a side note. I think people took mortgages for granted for a long time in Canada, and I really still think a lot of people do. And I don't think it's just Canada, but there's other places. Uh, little things are making a big difference now that, pe that were not as important in the past. Your credit. Typically, what someone will say to me is, I have a good credit score. I can get a mortgage, right? Well, a lender's not just looking at your score anymore, and they're looking at it a lot more deep than they ever used to. Just because your score is you know, 690 or 700 and it's above the acceptable amount, man, I, I just had an insurance agency because a client's buying with less than 20% down. They looked at that and said, oh, he missed a payment on his Desjardins credit card in the last two years. We're going to have to reduce his qualification amount by you know, X amount. One missed payment in the last two years, credit score of above 680, which you know a year ago would never have been an issue, never have been an issue, but we're starting to see them adapt and it's becoming more subjective. So definitely, I guess what I'm trying to say out of that is, number one, you know your segment in advance, start to do some research earlier in the process. Number two, talk to somebody who understands it. And number three, pay attention to your credit because it's coming more important. Yeah, I, I think you've, there's a lot there. And I, I guess just to kind of touch on your, you know, I, I can't imagine being on the front lines in the real estate trenches, I, I can't imagine buyers offering subject free based on an app saying, you know, replacing humans on the lending side saying, yeah, go for it. You know, like what I, I, at the end of the day, the like even us, we, if, if we have a client that is in a position to offer subject free on a place, it, it's crucial on who they're working with on the lending side, because if they're working with someone we don't know or, or an account manager at a single branch or bank, they're, it's hard to take their word for it, that they're, that they're good. And, you know, if, if, if they have to take the risk of a subject free offer, hearing it say they're okay from your voice, Alex, is a lot more confidence for us as realtors than, than I think an app could do, totally. or even, unfortunately, like even an account manager inside a bank that does more than just mortgages. And it's not yeah. even just yeah, getting yeah. a yes, Jamie. It's more like Alex and I literally had a conversation, what, Saturday, maybe, um, about a client who we saw a place that was wicked. It was like 60 days on market, so we assumed we could go in with subjects. As we wrote the offer, they got another offer, and the other offer was subject free. So literally called Alex immediately and said, hey, what is her risk level for purchasing subject free today based on this building? Here it is. It's X amount of years old. This is what the product is. And that 30 second conversation just provides so much value to clients and so much more peace of mind. And that can't be done through a program, through an app. No. Yeah, I appreciate you saying no. that. I think that's uh, that's fair. And I think our conversation was really good. I mean, you did a good job explaining, here's the building, here's the property, here's the situation. We have a clear understanding of the client's you know, down payment uh, financial situation and what their backup plan could be. That's it. Mm -hmm. Know your backup plan, purely that. And, and I know we, you did make a note on 
one of the posts that we had, and so Jamie, just to bring you in here, we, we had one of our posts where uh, our team member basically dictated what we said word for word. So we probably can alter some of it, but it said you should never go subject free if you're buying with less than 20% down. I'm going to tell you why, actually, I, I still believe in that. Um, it's not that you can't, I would just don't recommend it. Simple as that, because uh, we just had a client come over to us that was referred to us after they had been to their bank. They went subject free without any advice or consultation, which is not their fault because they didn't understand it. No one actually took the time to explain it to them and they didn't have anyone to ask. Okay. That's not on the client here in this case because they didn't understand it. It's on the other professionals that weren't available to them in this case, right? Yeah. Um, they went subject free on a property and of course they got declined by their bank in this case. They went to another uh, mortgage professional who shall be uh, unnamed here and he could not uh, get them qualified. And that's not on him by the way either because that was, you know, in this case, just client called him out of Google and said, hey, I need help, right? And they were referred over to us. Now, um, thank goodness, this is the client saving grace. They had four months to closing in this case. But the problem here was that the client was not getting declined so much by the lender. It was the insurance agency. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's only three insurance agencies in Canada. Mm -hmm. So you've got one, two, three strikes. <clears throat> and typically it's very difficult to walk over to a lender across the street and be like, actually that insurance agency declined my client. Will you take the application? They're just like, no, we don't want any of that, right? Otherwise they'll send it where they want to. So the good news about this client situation is it, it, it was a credit issue. They have four months to closing. They're not approved yet, by the way, but they have four months to get their ducks in a row. And based on the track they're going, we do have commitment that it's very likely they, they will get approved. Thank mm. goodness. That's not done. That, that saga is not over yet. But these per people could lose their deposit and lose their home. And that was because they didn't understand the ramifications of going in and buying a property with no conditions. And there's $25,000 on, the uh, on the table that they could lose. Mm. Just like that. So... The risk is yours to bear. I mean, we'll never say it. You guys will never say it. you have to go subject free. You'll say, hey, if you want the property, that's the option that you have on the table. I think the key to the client is just know your backup plan. If you're putting 20, 25, 30% down and you've got, you know, you're cool with, you know, maybe an alternate lending option. You got family who can help you out. You got some other money in the bank. The risk is yours to bear. If you're putting less than 20% down, probably not a good consideration. Um, we just don't recommend it. Yeah, well, that's, it, yeah, you, I think you nailed it. You just have to be willing to have more risk at losing your deposit plus potential damages if uh, mm -hmm. if there are any which i don't think in this market there would be but you know it's a, it's a gamble it's, a, <laughs> it's always such a tough yeah. situation to be in in the mortgage space because we're telling someone to do something that it's not our money to give away right it's it's somebody else's money to give away and it's their decision to make not ours right and you guys are in a situation where you're dealing with emotions in the heat of the environment and you know how competitive it is right now right had a i watched a hilarious video that was making the rounds on what tiktok or instagram or something like that the other day about a guy trying to sell an apple and then the other guys yeah. all bidding it up and cracked up when I when I when I saw that because that's reality right now. It's like there is yeah. no sense in it. So to someone listening to this, if you're a real estate agent, I think the feedback there is um, just make sure that the person that's taking care of your client gets it, understands it, and it, it can articulate that to your client. And or listen to a podcast a podcast like this, talk to guys like me, and at least understand the ramifications so that you can articulate this to your clients properly. That way you can at least recuse yourself and and not feel stressed out if you've explained it and they've made a decision. The key for us on both sides as real estate professionals and as mortgage professionals is communication and how that's communicated to a client. It's my only comment to your post there. And the reason I, I even brought it up is because I wanted to have this conversation with someone on your side of the industry is I just don't believe in concrete answers. So when people say never, I always assume there's a way that it, that it can be done, right? So my thought was if you have less than 20% down, buying a, like a two-year-old building that is priced correctly and you're not overspending. So the appraisal is not going to be a problem. The risk involved in doing that is fairly low for finding your dream home. So that's all that I kind of wanted to say was the communication from both of our sides on mortgage and in the real estate world is so important of educating the consumer in terms of a level of risk versus don't do that or do that. Good points. Well said. Uh, I like it. Never say no. There's always a way. You just have to figure it out. Totally. And understand like what risk kind of, that involves. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point, Eddie. I mean, there's certain situations where people are buying well within their means and, and it is a calculated risk. And yeah, you got to make those calls. So yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm really if, curious. Oh, go ahead. 
No, I was just going to say, if we could do this around again, just back to your point about segmentation, because I, I feel like we didn't touch on that enough. Like, well, I think- I, That's what I was going to bring up. I, I, I have more there because I'm really, when you mention, well, we've, we've had clients with this, but this, the segmentation, like the Canadian emergency wage subsidy that a lot of people are on, like, so there's, there's people that are homeowners that are on that. There's, um, there's people that want to be homeowners that are on that. And you, you mentioned they're potentially getting to a three-year average of income. And I imagine government subsidy is probably not included in that. Uh, how are these, what is your, when you, when, when people that are homeowners now and say, you know, an income, their income was used to qualify for the home they own, but now they're on a subsidy or for anyone that is on a subsidy currently that knows that they're going to have good income over the next year or two, how, what comes to mind in terms of lending there? Are they going to be able to get the more, are they going to be in trouble? Are they going to get mortgage? What? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, anybody that's on CERB or kind of subsidy, it's not recommended by, or it's, it's not, um, uh, how should I say this, typically considered by uh, your your standard bank. And, and I think the reality of that is just because the banks can't prove that you're actually necessarily going to come back to work. Is your job going to be there when you get back, even if you were to quit or get fired the next day? I mean, there's a lot to it behind that. But ultimately, if you're on a wage subsidy program, it's not considered because it isn't an ongoing guaranteed income, as we know, right? It's like EI. EI is there to get you back on your feet. It is not your income. It is not your job. So they're not going to register that. And so I, I to be honest with you, I just um, empathize for people in those situations and say it's it's an unfortunate thing. It's just like using your job. Thankfully, they still have some money that's going to help them get back and hopefully will get them back to work. Um, plan things out as best you can in advance. Be prepared. If it's an emergency situation, you can always look at some type of either alternate or private lending solutions um, for people on different types of wage subsidies. There are options out there if you have enough equity in the home and you're drowning in debt from other you know, sources. Uh, but I think, I don't know, Jamie, I guess my, my feedback there would just be try to get ahead of it. Be prepared if it is something we, like we have had clients in the past mutually that uh, are, are trying to recover from this ter- sort of situation. I just hope they can get their jobs back and we can start to look at qualifying them. At this point right now, um, it's just, I just wouldn't recommend it. There's just not enough, um, you know, it's just like trying to go buy a home now, not knowing if you're going to have a job tomorrow. It's probably not a, a, an ideal situation for those families anyways, from a financial standpoint. Have you seen yet, um, you, you mentioned a few minutes ago, but one person or person missing one credit card payment a couple of years ago and that affecting them. Have you seen credit scores or lending get affected by people who had deferred their mortgages through the early part of COVID? Okay. So uh, there's a two part answer to that question. In writing, there hasn't been any kind of confirmation. Like they haven't said we will, like they basically told us that they're going to not qualify someone because they deferred their mortgage. But you got to wonder if you have a borderline file and an underwriter is looking at that file and it's their job to approve or decline it. And they see that this client had deferred credit card, deferred car loan, deferred mortgage payment. And now they're trying to borrow, let's say, instead of you know the 300,000, they want to go up to a million dollars and they're on the very, very edge or we're asking for an exception. I'm not saying it would or would not happen, but I'm going to go ahead and suggest it's highly likely that someone who's on the other end of that table might say, mm, you know, I'm not really comfortable with that decision versus someone who maybe had not deferred and had not shown any of those on their bureau. Again, I think that's probably a, a Switzerland answer there, but I'm going to suggest that it's not written down, but it's it's possible that if it came you know, to a borderline situation, that deferment could impact someone at that point. And at the very least, it could cause hesitation, which hesitation is enough for a bank to say yes or no. We don't operate in black and white anymore in lending. We operate in a ton of gray areas, as you guys know from a lot of conversations we've had. Um, a lot of what happens is based on exceptions, and exceptions are never guaranteed. So if you're someone who's looking for an exception and you haven't put yourself in the best financial situation, it could be a lot more difficult for someone to approve your file versus the alternative. Talking to my underwriter at 10 a.m. from one of my banks yesterday morning, it was she had done 10 applic- sorry, 10 approvals that day and she had done four declines. And this is 10 a.m. Um, in, in the middle of, of April, right? So that's a pretty high number from, a, from an underwriter there at that early of a timeline. And my thought process there is if she's just going through all these files, I mean, she's going to analyze, she's going to look at it based on her policy. But the reality is, is if you're giving that person a reason not to approve you when they have that much business coming in the door, chances are they might not give you that exception. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good comment. Mm-hmm. You, you, segmentation, are we, when we're, but when I'm thinking of segments, I'm thinking of, you know, different industries, different job types, different uh, people on, so on, on the CERB versus, versus not. Is, is there something I'm not thinking of there, Alex? I mean, it, 
Man, I think I think personally we should come back and if you guys are down for it, I think we should do a, a round two of this uh, of this one and focus. And when I'm talking about segments, I'm talking about how lending has been segmented out based on everything from employment mm. to credit score to different types of products and rates and terms and, and offers and features. I mean, why why gotcha. does one bank's rate range go from you know 1.35 to 2.95? Why is there such a big gap there? And why are people di- being priced differently? And why is their qualification impactful? I think the more consumers that understand why interest rates are different uh, and why there's different solutions, why there's different products, the better. It's the exact same reason that a heavy duty loaded truck is 120 grand, whereas the entry level model is you know 50 grand. It's the yes. same thing, but in, in lending terms, you, you, it's not all the same. It's not all equal. Let's um, let's definitely set up a round two, but we've been going for an hour and I know we uh, both have some busy work days ahead. Most more knowledgeable man in the mortgage industry in BC. <laughs> I called it first. Again, I look forward to round two. And if anybody enjoyed what they heard today, check out the uh, YVR Remo Show um, podcast. We appreciate it.